Hey everybody, thanks for joining in on the message today. My prayer is that it strengthens your faith and encourages your heart and speaks something powerful into your life. If this message turns out to be a blessing to you and speaks to you, would you consider sharing it with someone else? We want to get the word out to as many people as we possibly can. Now join us for this message. Thanks. I'm glad that you're joining us here online this morning. It is so good to have you wherever you're joining us from, whether it's Moose Jaw, somewhere else in Canada, or across the world. We're so thankful that you're here this morning. You know, I don't know about you. Let me just ask you this question. How are you doing in your faith? That's not an accusation. It's not a judgment. I'm just wondering, how are you doing? Because I don't know about you, I found my faith tested quite a bit throughout this time. You know, we've gone through stuff that we've not really been prepared for. None of us have ever been through anything like this before, so it kind of shakes your world a little bit. Uh, And there's days I get up and I'm like, me and God, we can do anything. Bring it on. And then there's other days it feels like there's this dense fog around me and I can't see where I'm going. Uh, I can't see my hand in front of me. I don't know what's up or down or left or right. Uh, And it's just a weird situation. And I know that there's things in my life where I've found that I've, I've been putting my trust in them and didn't realize that I had been, and realized that actually it's just it's not a firm foundation. The only firm, firm, firm foundation we've got is Jesus. He's the only thing that never changes and never moves. He's always the same. And I was reminded of this verse in Hebrews. It says in chapter 10, verse 23, Let us hold unswervingly, I love that word, unswervingly to the faith that we profess. And he doesn't leave it there. He gives us a reason why we can hold unswerving. And he says, because he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. He will never fail us. He'll never let us down. And you know what? God uses these times to test our faith. The Bible actually says that God will test our faith because he wants to refine it. He wants to make it stronger. He wants it to go deeper in him so that when we hit times like this, we're not shaken. We're standing on a firm foundation. And we know that no matter what happens, God is in control, and God is going to see us through it. You know, I found this time so distracting. Uh, You know, uh, part of what we're doing is we're working from home a lot, uh, and that's really hard to concentrate. Uh, I much prefer kind of being in the office, but uh, the flexibility helps as well. But I find myself sometimes just being consumed by everything that's going on, trying to get my head uh, out of the clouds and trying to think, you know, there's actually a life that's going on around me as well, uh, and it's not all COVID-19 related. Uh, And I found myself complaining about the things that I can't have or, or can't do anymore, and I'm not too worried about some of it because you know, now I don't have to go in, uh, in the shops as often as I can. I just shop more online, which is fantastic. Uh, but I, I find myself uh, being reminded so many times of how I need to keep my focus on Jesus, and yet finding it so difficult at times as well to do that. Knowing that looking at Jesus all the time is the most important thing, and yet finding so many of the things are battling for my attention and making it difficult. You know, we're in the, the last series, uh, last sermon in our series on resilient faith, what it means to have faith that endures, faith that holds firm, faith that stands fast, but not just that, faith that produces, faith that's active and living. It's not just clinging on, it's actually growing through this time as well. And so I'm excited just to kind of finish this series off, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about a story that I haven't uh, uh, kind of uh, read for quite a while, and so uh, I just want to kind of uh, talk about that a little bit this morning. I don't know about you, I'm sick and tired of hearing about COVID-19. <laughs> I'm at that point where I'm like, oh man, I wish this was done. It would be easy to just put my uh, head in the sand and live in denial and not think about it. Uh, but the reality is, it, it is a reality. It's what we're living through at the moment. And what I want to talk about is how do we live through this in a way that is thriving and active and growing at the same time. Because there's one part of my personality I'm not actually a big fan of. Uh, I would consider myself probably a realist. I tend to be a little bit black and white, and and, and I tend to lean a little bit towards the negative in things before I see the positive. I tend to find the things that, why it wouldn't work, what could possibly go wrong, and then eventually I might come around to, oh yeah, this could work if we do that. Uh, and, I, and I love my wife for this. My wife, Helen, she's the optimist in our relationship. Uh, she will see the blessings of God in the minutest things. And I love that about her because it helps me. I, I need that perspective check sometimes. I need to get my head up again and see, wow, there's a much bigger picture going on here. Uh, don't get bogged down in the details. Something that God is doing and I'm missing it. And she helps me to lift my head up uh, through those times. And she has many times through this time as well. And I want to talk about that this morning. I want to talk about that need for a perspective check. 
You know, what is it that's going to help us get through this time in a way that we come out of it thinking, yeah, I did it. We got through it, and we, would, we didn't just survive it. We lived it. We, we were faithful people through it. And the one thing I want to kind of highlight this morning is this understanding of the sovereignty of God. And when we talk about the sovereignty of God, we're talking about the ultimate power and authority that God has over all of creation. That there is not one thing that isn't under his supreme authority and power. He is in control of everything. And I don't know about you, there's times that I wonder, is he? Where, where is God? You know, I, I almost dressed up in my son's wears Wally suit this morning, and I, I kind of wish I had. You know, because sometimes we're going through life and, it's, and we're looking for God like it's trying to find Wally. Like we're looking through this sea of people and, and God's in there somewhere. But the actual opposite is true. God is everywhere all at the same time, involved in everything that's going on. And I think sometimes we need that perspective check to kind of lift up our heads again and say, wow, God is at work in the world. And his power is unrivaled. It's unmatched. There is nobody that can usurp God. Nobody's ever going to overtake God. Nobody's ever going to take his throne away from him. He's in control. And that gives us the confidence that we've got to go through this time together. And you know, as I was talking, as I was thinking about and praying about this message, a, a story came to mind that I haven't read for quite a while. I know it very well. I've, I've studied it in the past, but I haven't looked at it for a long time. And it's a story about three guys, three Jewish guys called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're probably quite familiar with it, uh, or at least heard of it. You know, Daniel uh, was one of his friends. Daniel in the lion's den is a very kind of famous Bible story. And it's all in this same book, the book of Daniel. And as I was thinking about this, uh, kind of, uh, in my kind of one of my distracted modes, uh, I, I, I was thinking about the, the, the movies uh, Back to the Future. You know, Marty McFly, and, and he ends up going to the future, but then he comes back to the past, and then at some point he's in the past, and he's kind of all over the place. And one of the things that I realized was that no matter where he is, there always seems to be problems. He's always battling something. Nothing's ever going smooth. He's always got to figure something out. And as we go back to this story, this story happened about 2,600 years ago in 6th century BC. Uh, and, 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 I'm, and, and they're going through stuff the same, uh, even worse than what we're going through. What's happened is they're living life as normally. They're living in Jerusalem. They're living in the southern part of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, life's going okay. There's nothing going wrong. But unbeknownst to them, the Babylonian empire is on the rise. And eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar reaches Jerusalem. He besieges it. He takes over it. He carries off loads of stuff out of Jerusalem, along with a bucket load of people as well. And among those people are Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They get to Babylon, and they're subjected to three years of re-education. They're basically being forced to assimilate to become Babylonians. They're not going to be Jews anymore. They've got to learn how to think like a Babylonian. All the customs and the culture and everything to do with that world is now their new reality. Because as far as they know, they will live and die in Babylon. There's no hope for them to ever return to Jerusalem. This is where they're going to live, and this is what they have to live through. And part of the story right at the beginning of the book of Daniel is that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has this dream and he calls all his wise men together. And he said, I want you to tell me this dream, and I want you to interpret for me. And the, and the wise men are like, nobody can do that. Only a God could do that, and gods don't live on this world. But then uh, Daniel says, give me time to pray, and we'll get an interpretation. So Daniel and his three friends pray, and they ask God for the interpretation. And Daniel goes to the king, tells him what's going on. The king's amazed, gives Daniel this amazing position over all the wise men in Babylon, which, again, sounds like a fantastic job, until you realize who Daniel's in charge of. He's described as magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers. These are not God-fearing people. These are God who are into all sorts of strange practices. So Daniel's job may sound amazing, but it actually isn't. But then it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also promoted in Babylon. And again, it sounds like it's going to be a great thing until we realize later on that actually they've been promoted above other people who were already there. And uh, outside is being promoted. Doesn't always go down well. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. Whatever's gone, and we're not quite sure what the time span is, at some point, Daniel, uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, builds this um, uh, statue. And it's 90 feet tall by 90 feet wide. I, I don't know about you, but it just sounds like a square. 
Did he just build a square of gold? I don't know. But it sounds a little bit weird. But one of the things that's unusual about it is, is the size of it. Most of the statues that they would have built would have been about, kind of about 15, 20 feet tall. Pretty imposing, obvious idols. But Daniel's, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's is massive. It is enormous and it's made out of solid gold. And, and one of the things that we need to understand about this story is that that statue represents something that has taken our focus away from God. It was the same for Daniel and his three friends. They, everybody was told in the whole entire kingdom that when the music plays, and it, and it kind of goes through this description of the zither and the harp and the lyre, and it's kind of like, if you think of like a movie, it's building the tension. So that when you hear those instruments playing, if you don't bow down, the decree is that you will die. You will be thrown into a fiery furnace. It's pretty extreme when we think about it. Not many of us will ever face something like that. But this statue is meant to kind of prick our hearts and say, are there any idols in our life that is taking the place of God? Is there anything in your life right now that has your attention more than God does? Because that's what's going on here. And these men, these three men, are going to find out what it means to follow God right to the very end. What is it going to mean to follow God no matter what? Because ultimately, God is the only one who should ever have the attention of our heart. He's the only one that deserves our worship. And so the music starts to play. And what's going to happen? Well, it says that Nebuchadnezzar is looking over the plain of Jewry. He's looking over Babylon to see what happens. And as far as he can see, everything is going according to plan. Everybody's bowing down. But somewhere, three Jewish men are standing up. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I, I try and put myself in their shoes and wonder what that must have been like in that time when everybody else, and bear in mind, they're not the only Jews that have been captured. There will be hundreds, thousands of Jews in Babylon. They're all bowing down, and they shouldn't be. Because the one thing that these Jews recite every morning is something called the Shema, where it says, the Lord our God is one. We only worship one God. We can't worship a false idol. And these guys are putting their faith where it really matters. So everything's going okay, seemingly. But do you remember the other wise men that they got promoted above? Well, they've got a little plan in store. They're not going to let them get away with it. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're standing. Nothing seems to be happening. It seems to be like, whoa, I think we've got away with it this time. But lo and behold, to them, these little wise men kind of gone off to King Nebuchadnezzar. They're kind of sidling up to the king. Hey, king. Do you remember that decree you made that when the music plays, everyone should bow down? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, you know, we don't know whether we should say anything or not. But there's three guys over there that aren't bowing down. And that kind of destroys your authority a little bit. Don't you think, King? Yeah. Well, what happens? The king blows a gasket. He is furious with these guys. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they hauled before the king. And they have to give an account of why they didn't bow down. And amazingly enough, the king gives them one more chance to get it right. And he tells them when the music plays, when the harp and the zither, or whatever one of those is, and the lyre plays, you must bow down. Or you're in the fire. And now all of a sudden, the reality really hits home here. These aren't empty words. There is no sense that the king might be just kind of giving out false threats, making sure that everybody does. No, they're actually going to, if they don't bow down, they're going in the fire. As bad as it could get, they're facing it right now. It's follow God and die or deny God and bow down. It's the reality that these three men are facing. So they get there. And their faith is tested right to the very limit. And, and the amazing thing about this is, this is where we see that faith is not blind faith. Our faith, rooted in the sovereignty of God, gives us the absolute confidence we need to face whatever trial in life we may face. COVID-19 won't last forever. It's what we're going through right now. But life will continue on after this. And we'll still face trials. We'll still face difficulties. But the whole point of this story is to remind us that when God is in control... We can be absolutely confident no matter what. 
that he is working out his purposes, and they will work out. God will not fail in what he's aiming to do. It's a faith that's uh, firmly, and uh, like the writer of the Hebrew said, unswervingly held in God. It's not in some abstract, if I just try really hard and, and, and hope really hard, things might just work out okay. Things will work out okay because God said they will. It may not necessarily be the way I want them to or the way I expect them to, but they will work out okay because God's planned it to do so. And so these guys are absolutely sure that God is who he says he is and he can do all that he says he can do. That whatever God's got in mind here, it's going to happen because he said it will. He who promised is faithful. In fact, when we go back to the very beginning of the book of Daniel in chapter 1 in verse 2, it actually says they're in captivity because God made it happen. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's plan. It was God's plan. King Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's in control, but he's not. God's in control. God's making things happen. And it's crazy. God has a purpose. In all that's going on, God is calling the shots. King Nebuchadnezzar is just really doing as he's told. He just didn't realize it. And what we see here is that God's placed some key people in key places. Because one thing that's going to happen is that all throughout history, this story is going to be told. 2,600 years later, here we are telling the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's amazing. But it's not only that. God is saying to all of his people, including all of the ones that are bowing down in front of a false idol, that you can stay the course. I'm in control. You can trust me. And no matter what we're facing right now, whether it's COVID-19 related or not, because many of us are facing things that have got nothing to do with this pandemic, we can know that God is in control. And I think if there's one verse that we need to understand and grasp today, it's Romans 8 verse 28. And it says this, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. It doesn't just say some things or most things or a lot of things, in all things, God is working together for your good. Why? Because we've been called according to his purpose. You know, it really struck me again, I was reminded of this when I read this verse, you know, it's not about you and me, it's about God. It's about his purpose and what he's doing in this world. And we're called into that with him, we're called to partner with him. And we need that reality check, that perspective check again to say, wow, it's really not about me. That's okay. That takes a lot of pressure off. It's about God. And he's promised that he's going to fulfill his purposes no matter what. You know, it's amazing. Three times this week, I was reminded of the same story in different places. It's a story of Corrie ten Boom. And if you've read her book, The Hiding Place, if not, I encourage you to read it. Just a fantastic uh, testimony of her life through uh, being in uh, Ravensbrück, a concentration camp during the Second World War. Brutal, brutal place to be. Uh, and her and her sister Bessie were in one of the barracks, and these barracks were just horrendous places to be. Uh, literally hundreds, thousands of women crammed into tight spaces, three or four sharing a, a small sleeping area. Uh, uh, just sanitation was horrendous, sleeping on rancid hair, uh, just, just the worst conditions that we could possibly ever think of. Uh, and during this time, their, their particular barracks got an infestation of lice and fleas just to kind of top it all off. Uh, and Corrie's at this point where she's like, I just, I don't know how much more I can take this. Uh, and her sister Betsy was praying and she said, Corrie, we have to be thankful in everything. And Corrie's uh, and, and like, how on earth can I be thankful in this? It, it, life couldn't get any worse than this, could it? And what they didn't realize was that uh, you know, often in many of the other barracks, the guards would come in and, and horrible things would happen. But the guards wouldn't come anywhere near their barracks because of the infestation of lice and fleas. Not one single one ever entered that barrack. Uh, and they were able to have uh, pre Bible studies and prayer times with the ladies in those barracks and lead many to Jesus as a result of it. At that point, Corey said, I understand now that I can be thankful for the fleas. Even in the worst of situations, there's an opportunity to be thankful for God. We just need to sometimes lift up our head and realize he is in control. That no matter what storm we're facing, no matter what difficulty we're facing, we are in God's control. He's, he's ultimately the one who's making it all happen. And so whatever you're facing right now, can I just encourage you, stop fighting God. Just let God be God. And let him do what he needs to do because he is working it out and he's got everything that he needs to make your life be what it needs to be. 
but it is about him. And so when we get back to this story, these guys have one more chance to save their own skin. One more chance. Bow down or you're done for. And what do they do? They keep standing there. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of this verse that Jesus talks about in Matthew 16, where he says, whoever wants to lose, uh, save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. I have to wonder, was Jesus thinking about people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when he was talking about that? He would know that story very well from Jewish history. Following Jesus means following Jesus no matter what. It doesn't matter what it is. And these guys are about to find out what no matter what means. It means death. But I love their response in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I'm like, oh man, kind of a bit of a red rag to a bull. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. That's the confidence of knowing that God's in control. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Now bear in mind, King Nebuchadnezzar is already furious. He is not uh, liking this at all. Have you ever been in a situation? <laughs> I was thinking about this. Have you ever been in a situation? Uh, I was thinking about this as a child when I was a, a kid. You know, where you're kind of pushing the boundaries with your parents. And then all of a sudden realize you've gone too far because their face changes. And you've gone, oh, I've done it. I've blown it. Now I'm in for it. I'm, I'm dead. This is exactly what's happened. King Nebuchadnezzar was furious, but now he is absolutely mad. He is going to do what he's going to do no matter what. And they have literally poured fuel on the fire. Because King Nebuchadnezzar's next command is, heat the furnace seven times hotter. You think it's hot now, you ain't seen nothing yet. And they're immediately bound, they're led up to the furnace, and they're thrown in. And it's so hot, it kills the guards that throw them in. I don't even know how that happens. But they die as well. I mean, it's just crazy. There's no kind of waiting. There's no, it's just like, nope, that's it, you're done, see ya. And they realize that this is what it means to follow God. That their trust in a sovereign God means that they will go through whatever they have to go through. This is the unswerving faith that the writer to the Hebrews is talking about. That we will hold fast no matter what happens to us because it's about God, it's not about us. What's causing you maybe to falter at the moment in your faith? Is it the loss of a job or maybe the pending loss of work? Financial struggles, health struggles outside of COVID-19? You know, I don't know about you, but our relationships have been tested through this because we've had to spend a whole lot more time together as a family. You know, your kids you have got your parents around a whole lot more. Never mind parents having kids around a whole lot more. That's a challenge. You know, our marriages uh, are under pressure because we're having to be together a whole lot more than maybe we used to being together. You know, whatever it is that's causing you to fall, be assured that God is in control. He's working things out for good. And you know, when, God, when COVID-19 18s, our God will still be there. He, our faith can still keep growing. And we can still be strong and we can still be active. And we, can, we can still be producing fruit for God in all that we do. And I just wanted to kind of have this little sidetrack here. In verse 15 in, the, in this story, King Nebuchadnezzar says uh, this amazing thing where he's really setting himself up as greater than God. Uh, it's, it's quite bizarre, just the pride and the arrogance in him. In verse 15 of chapter 3 in Daniel, he says, But if you do not worship it, the, the, the statue, you will be thrown immediately in the, into the blazing furnace, which I've already found out was true. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Oh, man, can you just hear the arrogance in who he is? Just crazy. What he's saying here really is, I'm greater than God. Nobody can rescue you from me. You're done for. I've made it happen. And you can't escape it. I wonder how many times throughout this, this trial and trials in the past and maybe trials in the future, the devil's sat on our little shoulder whispering, oh, you're done for now. You'll never get through this one. Even God can't save you now. Even God won't forgive you for that. God can't possibly love you anymore. The grace of God doesn't extend that far. And yet we need to remind the devil that the opposite is absolutely true. That when Scripture says there is no condemnation for those in Christ, 
that Jesus loves us, that God has made a way for us, and that God will provide a way out when we're tempted too much. All those things are the truth. Everything the devil brings is a lie. And that's when our faith comes in. That's when our faith in a sovereign God who has all power and authority, that's where our faith kicks in. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea what was going to happen. As far as they know, that's it. We're going. God will rescue us, but he's going to rescue us by death. We're going to see him on the other side. They had absolute confidence that God could rescue them. And he was going to one way or the other. They were either going to live and then be able to live for God some more, or they were going to die and be with God. One way or the other, God was going to rescue them. But they were not going to be swayed in their faith. They were staying unswervingly to the course that God had set for their life. You know, I remember a few years ago when I was back home in England, I worked for an independent Mercedes-Benz specialist. I was a service advisor for them. Uh, And it was a good job. I had a company car, uh, and uh, it seemed to be going well. The guy actually hired me because I was a Christian, and he thought I would be honest, and and he could trust me. What I found out later on was he was the opposite. (laughs) Uh, He was a bit of a crook, really. And as the months went on, he started to ask me to get the guys to do things like turn mileages back on cars. And I was like, I can't do that. That that goes against everything you hired me because I was honest and I had integrity. Uh, And I remember one morning, I I couldn't stand it anymore. I was laid in bed and I was kind of getting up ready to go to work. And I was just asking God, God, what do I do? I, I can't work for a guy like this. Uh, And and he immediately got this image in my mind of Joseph when part of his wife was trying to seduce him, he just ran, left his coat behind and everything, just ran, just got out of there as fast as he could. And I just felt God saying, run, get out. And I, and I was kind of arguing a bit with God. I'd say, but, but I haven't got a job to go to. We, we had two very young children and, and jobs weren't very plentiful in the UK. So it was like, if I lose this job, I, I don't have a job. How am I going to support my family? And it was like God just said, you, t- you say that you trust me. Now act like you trust me. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> what do I do with that? So I literally went into work, and I handed my notice in and said, I'm, I'm leaving right now. I can't work here anymore. And, and I left, and I had no job. There was nothing to go home to. Uh, I just went home and just prayed and just asked God. And, and somewhere along the line, God provided another job. I didn't know that he was going to. I just had to believe that he would, because God says that he's sovereign and he's in control. So he either is or he isn't. And so we have to trust him that he is and that God's going to bring us through this time. Whatever you're facing right now or whatever you're going to face in the future, I hope that you will remember this story, that the sovereignty of God is at work all of the time. He never stops. He's always in control. There's never a moment in your life where God isn't fully aware of what's going on and is already at work and has already been at work working things out for your good. You know, as we close, I just wanted to remind us about the grace of God. You know, wherever you are this morning, whatever you're facing, whether you feel like you've done pretty good so far or whether you feel like you've blown it. If you're anything like me, I feel like I've blown it so many times where I just think, ah, I wish I'd just been stronger in my faith in that moment. You know what? The grace of God is there for every single one of us. It, It reminds us that no matter how badly we've blown it, the undeserved favor of God is always there for us. You know, and one of the, the, the great scriptures in 1 John, uh, it tells us that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He'll forgive us. God wants to wipe the slate clean again. And so I just want to pray for us this morning. I want to pray for uh, everyone who's like me, who's struggled at times through this uh, crisis. And, and we'll have times in our life where we'll struggle again. You know, we're not perfect. We don't get it right all of the time. But we have a God who is so gracious and so merciful and so ready to forgive and can set our feet back on a firm foundation. And so I want to pray for you if that's where you're at this morning. And so I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to, uh, again, come back, and we're going to talk a little bit about those who don't know Jesus. So, Father, I want to thank you for every single one of your people who are joining with us this morning. I'm so glad that they're here, Lord, and I'm so glad that your word is living and active, and it's alive in us, Lord, and it's constantly conforming us and making us more like Jesus Christ. God, I pray for every person who's struggling through this time who needs to know that you are there for them. God, would you make that real to them right now? Would you help them that no matter what they're facing, no matter what they're struggling with, that you are in control, that you work all things together for good for those who love you. You're always at work on our behalf, Lord, but it's always about your purposes as well. So help us to understand that too, to not think it's about us and try and work things out the best for us, but God, just to yield and to surrender and allow you to be God and to do what you know is best. 
And I pray, God, that you would strengthen your people, that you would bring that faith into their hearts again that reminds them that you are sovereign, you are in control, and no one can take that away from you. You know, just as we close, I just want to say to those of you who may be watching online who don't know Jesus, you've never given your life to him. Today is the day to do that. You know, Jesus died for you. He came and gave his life for you so that you could have new life in him. And he rose again from the dead to prove that that new life is available. And so I want to encourage you, don't wait. Don't put it off any longer. Today is the day where you can give your life to Jesus Christ, where you can say, I need you to be my Lord. And, and Jesus being Lord means that he calls the shots. He's the one in control of your life now. Because I don't know if you're, if you're like me, when I'm in control, things don't go very well. But when Jesus is in control, I know that things will be good. And being Savior means that he frees us from the power of sin. He breaks the cycle of the things that we just keep doing wrong all the time. And so we want him to be our Lord and our Savior. And so I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I want you to join me by following that in your heart so that you can ask Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior this morning and find that new life in him and then journey with him every day after this. So Father, I pray that you would bring faith into people's hearts to believe. Lord Jesus, would you save people this morning? Jesus, come into our life. Save us from the power of sin. Save us from a life lived for ourselves and to, into a life that is lived for you, for your glory, for your purposes, for your honor. Lord, I pray that you would fill people with your Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior. We thank you for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you've done that this morning, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we've got some materials that we would love to give you. Uh, you can head to our website, fill out our Connect form, uh, and we would love to send you those materials. It just helps you walk with Jesus every day. This is about a relationship. It's not about fulfilling a set of rules and regulations. It's about loving Jesus and knowing Jesus personally. So we would love to connect with you about that some more as well. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the message today. I hope that that message was a huge blessing to you and spoke to your life. If you made a decision for Jesus today, we would love to know about it. If you could head over to our website at victorymj.com uh, and tell us, that would be fantastic. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love you to help us get the word out. You can do that by liking, subscribing, or even by giving. And if you're interested in making a donation to our ministry, again, you can do that over at victorymj.com. Thanks everybody for joining in and God bless.